And we move on now to Zach Phillips, who is an independent oil and gas consultant. I guess one of the things that we, that we, that we do is what, what do we really look for? It's the start with the asset. It's the size, the risk, and the doability. That is to say, is the juice worth the squeeze? Are we, is it big enough to, to accompany the risk? And can it be done given the skill set that we've got available to us? The next, really, the next real question comes down to the management, its track record, its skill set, and its ability to execute the plan that it's got. These are the guys that are going to be squeezing the asset. They're going to be applying the pressure to squeeze the juice out of the, and in, in the press, if you, as, it, as it were. And the next thing which we, we can't ignore is jurisdiction. The risks, the fairness, and the tax structure. The tax structure really comes down to the, the, the way in which you access the benefits of, of what you've done. The fairness, and, and that might seem like quite a trite uh, word to put in there, but if you disagree with the tax inspector, are you going to be getting a fair hearing or are you going to be told this is the way it is and suck it up? And of course, the risks really relate to to what extent do your your host government change the rules on you. Because let's not forget that a lot of these investments are made over an extended period of time. Paul's been in, in Georgia since 2008, and there's been a significant change in that period. So really, where we see all of these things coming together creates value. And there is no doubt, the asset is the juice worth the squeeze. The management, have we got the ability to be able to apply the pressure to squeeze the juice and jurisdiction. How much of that juice can we keep at the end of it? So it's rather interesting to hear everybody talking about valuations. Now, what we really have to get down to is the gap between value and worth. Now, if we look here, what we see is we've, we've got EV, and the sum of parts at the bottom. And if you, if you just in a, in, in, a rough, uh, in a rough parallel here, we've got, we've got assets trading significantly below where the EVs of the particular asset bases are. That means that there is always a disconnect between value and worth. What is value? Maybe we should explore that. Value is, is quasi-scientific. It's often done in, at, at desktop and is divorced to some extent from the underlying market and the psychology. That regard which something is held to deserve the importance of usefulness of something. Okay, let's have, keep that in mind. Worth. The level at which someone or something deserves to be valued or rated. Now, we can boil that down on the entire right-hand side to a single statement, what someone is actually going to pay for it. Okay? This is the key difference between value and worth. What causes that? Well, sometimes it's a concern with management, a technical skill set, a financial sophistry, or an ability to deliver. So here we have an asset. Can we get that management to deliver what it is they say they're going to deliver. Price deck. Now this is, this is a rather interesting one. Valuations are always based on a number of input parameters. Price deck is just one of those. So whether you're using the forward curve for your, your oil price or your gas price, or whether you, you're using some standard or, or benchmark being provided by your, your valuer. Often, it lacks appreciation of risk to price. If you were investing in a project in, in 2012, it would be a significantly different outlook on the future price deck than if you were investing in, say, 2015, when we reached the absolute, uh, the absolute bottom of the, of the oil price market. And of course, timing. Everybody expects there to be a fluctuation in the, in the price, but it's just about when. For companies, it also comes down to the portfolio risk. 
What's the, what's the asset mix? Is it oil? Is it gas? Geographical, is it in Russia? Is it in North Sea? Is it onshore, offshore? These are some of the questions that, that a lot of investors look at. And because we're all making a subjective interpretation of what impact these things have on, on the value of a particular asset, we assign a different worth to it. And of course, the good old hydrocarbon. Is it gas or is it oil? These are some of the other things that are significant drivers to providing the discount between, between value and worth. Okay. And again, the project, the route to valorization and fundability. Now these, these are often quite overlooked. The route to valorization is perhaps more keenly felt in the difference between a gas asset and an oil asset. There are some very large gas assets that have next to no worth because they are removed from the markets and the costs to getting them to a market are significant. Which of course then brings us on to our fundability. Now you and I as equity investors, what we want to make sure is that if we put our pound in today, that we're not going to be diluted with future fundraisings. So when you've got a project, one of the other big differences that drive equity, equity uh, psychology is to what extent will a particular project be able to access the alternative capital markets, whether it's prepay structures from the, from the traders or even senior secured debt pieces from the large institutional banks and, and pension funds. So that's, these are, are some of them, there are others of course, but these are some of the main, main causes that, that drive differences between value and worth. Now, the value gap in reality, what does, what does that look like? Well, if we look here, and what we're looking at here are, are liquids in North America. As you can see, we've got the reserves down at the bottom and we've got our EV at, up uh, on the, on the Y-axis. And it's not so much the numbers that I want you to look at here, it's going to be the interrelation between, between the two that we've, we've taken here. And I've deliberately chosen two diverse groups here, liquids in North America and gas in Russia. So what you, what you can see here is that for any given value of reserves, if you're a liquids in North America, you're going to be valued or you're going to have a higher worth that's significantly in excess of your compatriots in, in Russia, who operate in Russia. So this, in reality, is, is what we're talking about. And in this particular instance, we're talking about the risk, the geopolitical risk, the fairness of the particular stra tax structures that you're operating in, and of course, the actual tax structure itself. And of course, our old friend, doability, Liquids versus gas is a completely different concept. For gas, you need, to, you need to increase the complexity and the control over a particular process twofold over liquids. So what does that all relate to? What does that all come to? Well, what we have found is, is, that, is that listed EMP companies trade at around about 35 to 50 percent of their implied valuations. That means that you can expect, depending on where you are, a 70% discount or a 65% discount to your value as being your market worth. Now, that's, that's, that can be significant in some, uh, in some instances, and it, it really does bear um, keeping it in mind when we start talking about the interoperability between asset value and market worth as reflected in the, in, in the public markets. What I thought I'd do is I'd take you through perhaps how some of these things have a, a, a real impact and how going through some of those, those processes can see values change over time. Okay, so here we have our, our, our case study number one. We've got, again, EV up here. This is in, in millions of dollars. One million, ten million, a hundred million, a billion, ten billion and reserves 10 million, 100 million barrels, and a billion barrels right at the far side. 
So this particular company came to market looking to fund uh, an exploration well. Pre-drill estimates put it at around about 900, 800 to 900 million barrels of oil equivalent. They had identified it with a significant prospective resource, raised the money on IPO and, and drilled the first well. As we can see, what happened is there was a drilling success. The volumes shrunk, but the value went up significantly. Could we, could we say it should have gone up more? Quite possibly. But here we come to our, uh, the, the, other, the, the other driver in, in, in equity markets, fear and greed. Greed is, is driven by the fear of missing out. And the fear is driven by the greed of wanting to maximise and get as much bang for your buck. So what we've had is we had a, a drilling success. There was an appraisal programme. As part of that appraisal programme, they were able to convert a lot of the prospective resources into contingent resources, which were subsequently booked. A next round of appraisal actually saw the, the, the next drilling programme further reduce the, the volumes, but such was the, the, the de-risking in this particular case that the value, as, you, as, you, as we could see, went up substantially. And this pre-drill or this pre-development volumes are the ones that, 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 are, are being, um, that are being used to sanction the development. So if we look here, the risk, the only difference between here and here is that the risk has really been eliminated. Substantial value has been created. Case study number two. We've got a, a company with a diverse set of, ass, set of assets. There's been a change in strategic direction to sharpen the focus and the cash that's existing in the company is going to fund that, that change of strategic direction. So what we have here, the original portfolio considered relatively unattractive, not an in inconsiderable amount of, of, of oil here, that's, that's for sure. So, announced the, the, the change in, uh, in strategy, the new portfolio, people are excited, they, they want to be part of it, so you see a modest increase in reserves, but again, we see a, a corresponding increase in, in value. The extended way, uh, appraisal programme shows yet more interest in, in this particular asset base. And the, the volumes increase, but the value increases almost exponentially in, in, in comparison to the increase in volumes. However, what we've had in this particular instance, there has been incremental improvements in, in the volumes, but there has been such delay to the disclosure of a, co a, a cogent development strategy that people have got concerns that the project is doable. So this, in real terms, is what we're seeing here. Is it going to happen? You've been telling us it's going to happen, but is it going to happen? Okay. Case study number three. A company with a huge set of diverse and producing assets, very strong cash flow, significant portfolio at all phases of the, of the exploration cycle. And in this particular instance, we have a healthy cash flow supporting an active appraisal program. And from IPO, we see it moving both ways, both increasing in value and in, in reserves. What happens is that we have the development projects further driving the reserves and that further increases the value of the of the company the oil price sees everything that that this company is doing basically coming up gold even what was marginal before is now becoming profitable but wait the project growth and reserves bookings are actually improving but here we have a management that's actually beset by rumours of corruption. Now, corruption at the management, at the sea level, is corrosive to the interpretation of value. Because if you can't trust your management team to deliver on your behalf, why would you hold the asset? 
What we saw in this particular case is a continued disintegration of confidence and an incompetent risk, mit risk mitigation strategy. Now, in this particular instance, it was a failure to take account of the impact that lower oil prices will have on your ability to pay back your debt. Now, debt, you have to remember, is like a, 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 a Siberian tiger. If you, keep, if you keep that beast fed, it will, it'll be nice, it'll, it'll pose for pictures. But if you starve it, it'll see you as its next meal. And so that proved to be. So what we had in this particular instance was a crisis as the management was ejected from the company. The shares were suspended. And at this, at this point, the, the equity holders don't know what's going to happen. Will the debt holders, will they perfect their security package and take away the assets? Or do they see more value to be had from exercising their right as bondholders to take equity in the company at a price pretty much at their choosing, diluting all of the, equi the existing equity holders, but you still, have a, um, you still have a shareholding. Now, this is what happened with Gulf Keystone. The bondholders, they took the equity, the equity holders, the existing equity holders, I should say, were diluted, but you still had paper that you could trade with a hope that in time you could recover some of the value that unfortunately you've lost. These things can be quite powerful because if you can get the conversion between the debt and the equity right, the existing equity holders actually sometimes see an improvement because the disappearance of the, the drag of the debt from the balance sheet is, is, a, is a positive effect and, and it offsets the dilution effect of the additional equity. So back to our case study number three, the shares are suspended. What does the bondholder choose to do in this instance? It chooses to take the assets. It pushes the company into insolvency. Investors lose their entire holding. It, it goes completely. Now these are some of the, some of the issues that we all need to bear in mind when we're, when we're investing in, in equities. We may think they're just, they're just uh, little parts on a, on, a, on a screen, but they have real value, they have real impact. And for all of um, the guys here today, we, everybody, it is the lifeblood of, of the business. So, conclusion. Value and worth are not the same thing. The assets must provide suitable upside or be worth investing in. <clears throat> a clear plan on how to realise that value will give investors confidence that the management teams know where they're going, they know the risks, and more importantly, that you've got confidence as an investor, as an owner in the company, I hasten to add. You own the company, it's your company that they are, going to, they are going to weather that storm with you and they are going to be able to pilot your company to, to smoother water. And that is where the management team are essential at the smaller end of the market. Because in essence, it's going to be the management team that go, that's going to deliver on your, on your plans, on your, on your asset values. And with that, that's me. Yep. Thank you, Zach. Thank you. So, any thoughts with regards to your own portfolios, your own experience as an investor, particularly in this sector? Okay, well, maybe... Is that a question or is that just a comment? Just a statement, okay. Um. Well, of, well, of course, I mean, what we, what we all have to do and, and, what, and what our responsibility is as investors is to make sure that we understand the risks that we're, we're actually getting into. 
It's the management's responsibility to articulate those risks. They're not going to make the decisions for you. They're going to be focusing on their assets and, and they are going to be wanting to make sure that they deliver on what they say they're going to deliver. There are always going to be risks. That's why, that's why equity is there. So the only, the only and, it, and it is, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Some of these things are quite sobering, but we must always understand the risks. Stay there, Jack, just for a minute, but yeah. we've got uh, uh, two managers here. I mean, what, what are your thoughts when you hear this from the point of view of the investor and the assessment process the investor makes? What, what thought do you give to your investors and the sort of process of how you deliver for them? Um, well, you're probably asking the wrong person because as a member of the management team, I always, I'm always going to say that our company is undervalued. Um, I do genuinely believe that, but you know, that, that's one for another. Uh, clearly, there is a, a, a mismatch, I think, um, in, you know, in, a lot of, in a lot of cases. And um, um, as you say, you know, the, the, the risks have to be sort of weighed, you know, weighed up with the potential uh, returns. I'm, I'm certainly interested by the statistic that you, that you put up around you know, companies sort of trading at sort of between 35 and, and 50% of the implied NPV. Um, certainly from, from my experience, you know, I, I probably see it as even, even lower than that simply because you know, we've all got projects that, that, that certainly we, you know, we feel, we say we've had CPR or independently uh, assessed as having much larger um, you know, NPVs obviously depends where you are in the in, in the cycle, but um, but often it feels that it's it's even even more of a discount than than that. Thanks, Paul. I thought it was a very clear and concise presentation, actually, and I thought it touched on a lot of key points that um, are often missed at this end of the market. Um, you're absolutely right. I think uh, one of the key ingredients, especially I look for it as a fellow investor, also, I mean, outside of Block Energy, of course, is um, is management. You know, can the team deliver? And uh, mm. I do think that you know, quite often you've got to take a deep dive yourself to get confident on um, the plan being able to, you know, the management being able to execute the plan. So, um, and nothing. of course, you are investors yourself, of course, uh, of in course. this process. Mm. Uh, we've got a question here. Have you got exposure or any experience in relation to deep water assets in oil and gas? Um, and what are, what's the criteria you tend to look? Because it's... It's quite challenging, uh, ultra deep water assets, generally speaking. And I'd just like to get your viewpoints upon that. Well, I, I think it really depends on on what you're what you're talking about as as, as ultra deep water and and three thousand meters and, and um, above. Well, I mean, uh, below in that case. <laughs> um, to, to be to be blunt, it's just an engineering challenge to overcome. Um, the the, the, what, what sometimes a lot of people look at as being hurdles and issues is just applying the same principles and the same bases to a new to a new uh, to a new regime to, or to a new uh, to a new situation. The 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 re reference to uh, to ultra deep water. I think is actually quite a pertinent one because 10 years ago you probably wouldn't have even thought of drilling in 2,000 metres. You know, that would be beyond the scope. Um, and it's not until people start over-engineering and then thinking, well, we've over-engineered this. How are we going to actually test what it does? And they, and they, they you know, they push that edge and they push that envelope and they push that envelope and with... With, with every iteration, you learn more. And in many ways, it's, it's, like a, it's like an appraisal program, is that each well gives you more information than you had before, and it will tell you more about what you can do and what you can't do with an appraisal program, with a particular asset. But in an engineering sense, it'll tell you what you can do and what you can't do with, with the physical construction. Now, the great thing, the great thing about, about the oil and gas business is, is that it, it does innovate and it does push and it's the open market and it's the free market that, that actually drives that. It was, it was really the drive to want to try and offset 
some of the significant profits that a lot of these US companies were making onshore that they started investing in R&D programs that made ultra deep water and things like the, the Gulf of Mexico ultra deep water possible because they, they felt it was a, a, a useful tool to write off their tax dollars so that they can actually say, okay, now we're investing in the future, get us, we want some R&D grants, we want some R&D tax credits, and away we go. And now out of that, you know, let's, let's not forget that 100 metres in the North Sea was considered, was, was considered really, really troubling in, in, in the 70s. Nowadays, such is the availability of technology, of engineering knowledge and know-how and construction, is that you can go to one of maybe 15 vendors that will, that will construct to exactly your specifications, to exactly the grade that you need it to, so that you can go and put your platform in 110 meters of water. You know, it, 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 you know and, that's, and that's, in, that's in 40, 50 years. I mean, that's, that's, that's truly amazing. Okay, um, another question over here. Perhaps just take uh, Hi, one uh, more one question. Uh, more, than, uh, more often than not, you see the oil field are in the sea or the offshore, yeah? So what's your general, general view on the onshore oil exploration, Is in particular the UK onshore oil industry? Uh, that's question number one. And uh, number two is, which field or region do you think is um, promising in your personal opinion? Thank you. Um, well, I think the, the difference between onshore and offshore is, is really made um, stark uh, by the kind, of, the kind of issues that, the, um, that those that are, shape, that are chasing the shale series in the East Midlands Basin are facing today. You know, we, we as an, we've been fracking for, for, for 40 years. It's now suddenly become very unpopular. But that, that understanding, or, or rather that desire to want to stop fracking, really stops at the coastline. Because offshore, nobody really cares the fact that we've been, we've been fracking for about the last 20, 30 years. And, and in fact, to maximise recoverability from some of the, some of the fields that, that, are, that are legacy, if you like, are at the tail end of production, we've been happily fracking those for about the last 10 years. So, you know, it, it's, it's about, to be honest with you, onshore UK is, there, there are a lot of headwinds. Um, oil onshore UK is even more headwinds. Gas, I, I think that there's going to be, there, there's, there's more of a follow through, but anything that, that uses the U, as in unconventional, is, is going to find it very difficult in, in the United Kingdom. As for, as for what you're, um, as for what you're uh, asking in, in terms of the, um, the, the, the next hotspot, um, I think that that's, I mean, it's always really difficult to, to, to predict that, but, um, but the, the last hotspot was offshore Guiana. Now, offshore Guiana has been, has been on everybody's radar screen since about 2002, 2003. Um, we looked at a, a number of projects in offshore Guiana for fraction, fractions of, of, of the type of investment that, that, that was required today. But what really brought that home to me was the fact that I was at the um, Africa Oil Week and the although you're supposed to be there and talking about oil and gas in Africa, nearly everybody was talking about the pending, uh, the, pen, the, the recent results and the pending drill program in Guyana. So there, you know, even I noticed where the, where, what was hot and what was not. Um, the next one, I think, in, in, in my opinion, what we've seen in, in places like the United States and some of the traditional basins is a consolidation of, of players and the, the pullback of liquidity, which has meant that the threshold for investing has risen. If we look at the United States, that threshold is now at around about the $1 billion mark. A market cap of a $1 billion is what you need to be considered small cap in the United States. That means that there is a tremendous amount of money 
that is going to be required to be invested in onshore United States, even in legacy planes, that's relatively low risk, but is going to want to find a home. And I think the next best place for, for some of these guys to go is to come to London. Um, and it's, it's going to be interesting to see, but, um, you know, I think, I think that there is, I think the, the US onshore, Permian Basin accepted, but the US onshore is going to start to, to, to show certain promise, for, certainly for in, the, in the oil and gas segment. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you very much indeed, everybody. Thank you.